Hi, I'm Jake. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the different stages in getting better as a Magic the Gathering player. Today, I want to cover the first step, the new player experience. I'm going to talk about the general rules of the game, a little bit about deck building, and then some things you can do while you play the game that help you to be a better player. If that sounds interesting, pull up a chair, have a seat at the table, and whether you're a button mash, hack and slash, controller bash, or a meeple moving mastermind of maps, mats, and minis, if you ruffle at the awful riffle shuffle scuffle, or if you're a click clack, pick attack, number ball, luck sack, we're all here for the same reason. I'm Jake, let's talk games. So I've been playing Magic the Gathering for nearly three decades now. And over that time, the new player experience has changed a lot. There's been a lot of new products released, new formats designed, and just internally the design of the cards that are being released have gone through a number of different changes. Nowhere is this more evident than in the preferred deck boxes of the greater Magic the Gathering community. I remember when I was first getting started, deck boxes were kind of becoming a thing and there weren't too many to choose from, but the vast majority of them were of this form. It holds one 60 card deck, maybe a sideboard, but that's about it. And you would take this with you and that would be it. This is your deck. But if we look at modern decks and boxes that people use for Magic the Gathering, they've increased in scale a lot. This is my go-to for Commander Game Nights. Uh, this is the Tolarian Community College uh, deck box that they made for the Kickstarter. And it holds an EDH deck, a 60 card deck, a big stack of tokens, some alternate cards I might put in the deck, a spin down life counter, a bunch of other plus one plus one counters or otherwise, and then also space for just some other larger cards on the side. It's really handy to have around, but as you can see, the complexity has gone up a lot. Part of that's just in the way that we play the game. It's generally expected that you have treasure tokens and map tokens and whatever else you're putting into play, but also in the cards themselves that put treasure tokens and map tokens and other things into play. And that complexity impacts your gameplay as a new player. But if we back away from the mechanics of cards and take a look at the structure of Magic the Gathering, I believe that the game itself stays pretty simple. So let's talk about the rules of Magic the Gathering first, and then we'll talk about the cards and the way that we build decks. Magic the Gathering has a reputation for being an incredibly complex game, and I think that's well deserved. There are definitely cases in Magic that require a lot of work to untangle what actually is happening on the board questions that need to be elevated to judges and kind of mold over and broken down. The comprehensive rules for magic are exceedingly long. But if we're talking just the basic rules of magic, they put it in every starter deck and it fits on a playing card. This is the entire structural rules of magic, how you play the game. There's a couple things on top of that, how you build a deck, uh, general actions you can do during a turn, and it excludes the core mechanic of Magic the Gathering. I think there's one mechanic that sets Magic apart from all of the games that came before and many of the games that came after, and that is the mana cost. Right, your mana cost determines how easy a card is to add into a multicolor deck. It determines what colors you need to have access to in order to cast the cards in your deck. It tells you how fast your deck is going to be. It tells you how balanced your deck is going to be. And by reading the rules text on the card, it can tell you how good any card is. Because I guarantee most of the cards that seem bad, if they were two mana cheaper, would be pretty good. And so once you understand mana cost and the phases of a turn, you are well on your way to understanding the game at large. Let's start with mana. Mana is produced by tapping land. One of the common confusion with new players is that mana equals land, and that's not the case. Mana is something that the lands can produce. There's also creatures and artifacts that produce mana. But that mana is never represented on the board itself. It floats. 
It's something that exists within an individual phase of a turn. See, one of the cool things about magic is because it's broken into different parts of a turn, between each of those parts, everything that's floating kind of clears away. And you're left with just the items that are on the board itself. So it becomes pretty easy to track what's active and what's not active, because the active things will be on the board. That's it. And so mana goes away between phases. In ages past, it used to be that if you couldn't spend the mana, not only do you lose it, but it deals damage to you. This became difficult to keep track of, and because it's not a board item, uh, there were cases where people couldn't remember whether they had three mana or four mana floating, or people would say, I had zero mana, so I don't take any damage, and their opponent would say, no, that tapped for two, so you should... That kind of thing. So they got rid of that. Mana burn is no longer something that we need to deal with. But between phases, all of that mana goes away. When you are building your deck, I think your mana costs and your lands are the singular most important part. Sorting your cards by color and then by mana cost gives you a very good picture of how your deck will play. So once we understand mana cost, then we move on to the parts of a turn. I've talked about this before, but the parts of a turn have four main constraints. The first is that you untap your cards one time. At the very beginning of your turn, anything that's been used, tapped, you untap it. So instead of being turned sideways, they're turned upright again. After you untap, you have an upkeep which is a phase that some cards will reference, but most of the time you'll skip right through. And then you'll draw one card. That's our second singular action of the turn. After we draw one card, we have our first main phase, during which you can play one land. There's cards that allow you to play additional lands, cards that allow you to draw additional cards, cards that allow you to untap multiple times. But built into the phases of the turn, each of those only happens once. And then finally, after your first main phase, you attack one time. Anything that allows you to attack multiple times, draw multiple cards, play multiple lands, or untap multiple times is going to get you ahead in the game and be extremely powerful. So look out for those effects. After you attack, there's a second main phase, and then your turn is over. Anything that references the end of the turn happens there. You discard down to seven cards at the end of your turn, and you pass it to your opponent. That's it. It's very straightforward, and you can keep track of everything because you only ever have to look at the cards that are in play. If you're a new player, I encourage you to only pay attention to the cards on the field that are directly interacting with you. That means your cards or cards of your opponents that are pointed at you. Either they're attacking you or they've activated an effect that impacts you in some way. And don't worry about the rest of the game actions, at least at first. Look at the cards that are in your hand and be thinking about what you want to do with those and be able to respond to the things that are interacting with you directly. But that's it. That's all you have to pay attention to for the rules of magic. One last note as an aspect of strategy. If you can do something later, wait to do it later. If you have a card that's instant speed, meaning you can use it whenever you want, Wait until the end of the turn right before yours to use it. Because there might be something else that happens and you'll want to use it sooner or later or use a different card that's an instant or respond in a different way. Playing a land might make more sense playing it on your second main phase after you attack. Playing creatures and sorceries usually make more sense to play after you attack. Waiting as long as you can for every game action you have is usually to your benefit. Another aspect of strategy that I think new players uh, tend to not act on is attacking with as many things as they can attack without dying. Right, If they have an army of 2-2s, two they're reluctant to attack with them because their opponent has a 4-4. It's usually worth it to trade one or two of your creatures for getting a significant amount of damage on your opponent. Most of the time, it's better to swing. Once you understand the rules of the game, we can move on to how we build our deck and how we start understanding the cards that we have access to. 
as a new player, our access to cards is probably pretty limited. Maybe we bought a pre-constructed deck, and Magic has a long history of making absolutely terrible pre-constructed decks for 60 card formats. This is my brother's first deck. It's a Disruptor deck, it's a red-black deck that was made during Mercadian Masks, and after playing the game for about two months, I think maybe three or four cards from the original deck were still in his deck. Because with a lot of these pre-constructed decks, the cards in them are bad. Now, Wizards has gotten better at that over time. The new Commander decks are actually pretty good. Out of this new Eldrazi precon that I picked up yesterday, I'm probably going to keep a majority of the cards in the deck. And that's as somebody who has a wide selection of cards and a number of cards that I've already set aside for potential inclusion in that deck. But as a new player, you're probably going to be stuck with whatever you currently have. So what I want you to think about as you play that deck is noting which cards get stuck in your hand. Not in a way that you are excited to play them later in the game, but in a way that they don't seem to really advance any of your strategy. One of the issues that commander decks used to have is that they'd be split along a few different strategies. And if you wanted to pursue any one of them, you'd remove some of the others and replace them with cards from other sets. Modern decks do a much better job of having a singular strategy and having most of the cards work towards that strategy with only a handful that are really suboptimal choices. And that's usually for price reasons. As much as Wizards of the Coast says that they ignore the secondary market, I know they haven't explicitly said that, but that's kind of the implication, uh, they don't. Uh, they intentionally exclude specific expensive cards, see the fetch lands and such. But the new decks do a pretty good job of having their strategies up front. And this is really beneficial as a new player because it allows you to pick a deck that does the things you want it to do. So before you buy anything for yourself, before you really delve into a particular deck, see if you can borrow some decks for friend, from friends. See if you can find some strategies that work for you. Recently, I've been playing a lot of Magic with my, my sister-in-law, and for the first couple times we played, she borrowed my wife's mono black deck. And it's a big mana, play out demons, and then you're angling for some sort of instant win, whether this is a Liliana's contract or some loop between uh, exquisite uh, blood and sanguine bond, or whether it is a, a, the, the Alcazat's demon and something that reduces everyone's life total by half. Something that ends the game in short order once you can get up to 9 or 10 mana. And I think the deck's reasonably fair, but oftentimes your turn is land, pass. Or land, big creature, pass. And that's not super interesting. The last couple times we played, instead she tried out my uh, the, the pre-con from uh, Murders at Karlov Manor called Deep Clue C. And that is a Bant value engine deck. And it does typical Bant value engine things. You, instead of drawing a card, playing a land, and passing, you draw a card, play a land, play a creature that makes a token, that you sack the token to make a clue, sack the creature for two mana to sack the clue and draw a card. And at the end of the turn, you're at the same spot as though you had just drawn, played a land, and passed. But you've taken more game actions. And that can be more interesting. It feels more interactive, and it gives you more options that you can discover later on. Fun ways of blending cards together that trigger off of each other, and you build out this Rube Goldberg machine to by the time you get to the end of the game, you have a million different things that you're doing every turn, and you really feel like you're able to drive the game forward in a positive way. And I think a lot of people engage with that differently than they engage with just playing big creatures and forcing answers from your opponent. Not saying that other people wouldn't prefer to just drop big creatures and force answers from your opponent. So understanding the strategy that works for you and the gameplay that you prefer helps you find the deck that you want to start diving into. And once you find that deck, I'd encourage you to play it a few times completely unaltered. I bought this Eldrazi deck last night and <laughs> I was extremely excited to open the box, see the cards that were inside. I ripped open the little two card bonus packet that comes with it. 
not expecting to get anything that I'm planning on using in it. And I got the Eldrazi Kindred Enchantment from the same set. But I'm going to hold to my rule and try playing this deck unaltered. See how it plays, see where its weaknesses lie, and then I am absolutely going to add that card to the deck. Because I was planning on buying that card anyways. It is tailor-made for this exact strategy. So I'm really excited for seeing this deck grow over time, but first, I need to know where this deck is starting. I need to understand how the deck plays and understand where it needs changes made. Once I understand the deck, then we can start looking at how we can use that deck to interact with our opponents and the board. And once you reach that point, once you have a deck that you enjoy, a deck that you understand the ins and outs, the strengths and weaknesses, and you're able to start modifying that deck, you're ready to move on. And at that point, you are no longer a new player. You understand your deck, you understand different changes that you can make and the pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses. You start to see what other people are playing and borrowing from their playstyles things that you can integrate into your own gameplay. You get a better feel for the rules of the game and the ways that you can take advantage of individual phases and turns. You can play head games with your opponent by keeping mana open. All of those fun aspects of the game start to come unlocked. And as a new player, that discovery process can be a lot of fun. And once you're out of that new player phase, it kind of feels like you've exited the tutorial mode. And all of a sudden you have access to the vast collection of 50,000 cards printed over Magic's history and all of the different options that exist within. I hope this has been a little bit helpful or maybe provided a little bit of structure for you as a new player or you as somebody who's trying to help out a new player. It's been really nice talking to you.